Hello and welcome to Brilliant Britain. I'm Bogdan Alexi. And I'm Lydia Maddox. We're here to bring you some more inspiring stories from people and communities who do something brilliant every day. Today we're hosting the show from Canterbury, a city famous for its cathedral, cobbled streets and being the setting of Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. You could easily see why Kent has been named the Garden of England. Because of its beautiful scenery and fantastic landscape, it's become a tourist attraction for people from all over the world. There are lots of different things to see and do in our city. You can watch a play at the Marlowe Theatre. Visit museums to learn about Canterbury's rich history and heritage. Or take a river tour. So what do you like about Canterbury? Is that it's all classic, old, really awesome buildings. It's like an international hub as well, so there's so many different people from so many different cultures. The cathedral, we've just been to a wonderful, uplifting service. Did you know that Canterbury Cathedral is one of the oldest in England? Restaurants, cafes, like places you can meet outside, inside. You've got like, a lot of live bands. It's um, the cultural and historical capital of the Garden of England, Kent. Canterbury was recently voted the third most vibrant city in the country. You can go walk down the high street and you'll just meet someone, someone from anywhere. It's fantastic. And the architecture is just beautiful. Coming up. Volunteers at Dandelion Time tell us about the benefits children and families have experienced through working on the farm. We go back to the Edwardian era when we visited the newly refurbished King's Hall in Herne Bay. And we've got music from acoustic artist Lucky Jackson. So today we're at the polo farm and we're getting ready for a new challenge. That's right, we'll be going head to head in a task that requires balls, Check. Rackets. We have a couple in the car. Are you sure? Though? I'm very sure, yeah. Okay, yep, you've checked that. Yep. And a wheelchair. Oh yes, I forgot to tell you. We'll be joining the local wheelchair tennis team and they'll be training us in this sport. But first, we need to get on the right course because this is not the right place. Is this to... not? No, it's just that way. We're in the... No, it's this way. this way. No, 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 I think that, I that think way. It's, that, it's definitely that, no, no, that way, way. yeah. yeah. Herne Farm Sports Club is a top-class sports facility for the East Kent area. Well, one day I hope to either go to London, but I don't, I'm not sure that's going to happen, but I hope it is. Um, play against Ernie Murray and win. <laughs> <laughs> Addy, we've got a player here. That'll be really good. Um, top tip, hot tip, keeping the chair moving. Don't let the chair stop. If you stop, you've lost everything. You must have the chair moving. Inertia is the enemy of wheelchair tennis players. I mean, it's just one of those vocations that you, every day, I really enjoy what I do. There's lots of challenges with the, with the work that I do. And yeah, it's just, you know, I feel very privileged that I'm able to do what I do every day. Where did you choose tennis out of all the sports? Uh, I just hadn't tried it before and I found it fun when I played it at primary school. I, I do want to try wheelchair rugby, but oh. you have to be 16 to do that, which is quite annoying. Yeah, it's still well away. About three years, but... It's quite a contact sport though, isn't it? Especially with chairs, it's quite a lot of clashing. But if you play, if you play it one sport, then you'll find that it helps in another sport, so that's, they all, it all works out. What part of the ball would you want to hit to? The nose. I think more the chin. I think you, it looks to me like you're not quite getting enough force through the bottom of the ball okay. to create that power. Oh, there you go. Some of the challenges of coaching, um, I think it's keeping people motivated, keeping people uh, interested in the activity, making the activity fun to do. Yeah, I mean, I think so many challenges and, and learning yourself, you know, actually 
continuously learning and improving the way you can deliver you know, your own skills and develop your own skills. Well, well for me, this was, I got a phone call, I, this is only my second ever session, although I've been a coach for 18 years, only my second ever session working with players to here today, um, and their main coach couldn't, couldn't do three sessions. He rang me up and I thought, in my 18 years I've experienced most things in coaching and this was a completely new challenge for me, um, but having done it, um, it's about people still, it's about people talking to people, finding out what they want to get out of their time on court and trying to help them, you know, the best that you can. So that was a lot of fun? It was, and it was a very different way of playing a sport that we all know. So if you'd like to let us know how you've been keeping active, just go on Twitter from your accounts right now and tweet hashtag something brilliant and stay tuned for what's coming up next. What's coming up next? The next segment. Stay tuned, watch it. We're here in Maidstone, Kent to visit Dandelion Time. A project that supports those that have suffered traumatic experiences. Dandelion is only in existence because it is wanted by the community that it seeks to serve. And the community have said to us over these 10 years, you're doing something for the children who are, are the most neglected and who, are, and who have struggled with serious uh, issues around abuse and have been traumatised. Often Dandelion is uh, called upon as, as, as the last service for children, um, where other services have not achieved some success. If you are um, a person or a child who's experienced trauma, you may get triggers to go back into trauma. And we know with trauma that there is a flight, a fight or a freezing process. So when that comes, there's a very, very vivid imagination, a very vivid experience, once again, of a time when you were quite terrified. And so what we do here with children, if they're in that place, we're looking for those things that help them to feel calm and safe. And the outside world, actually, for some children, can offer a very safe healing place. You can hear the wind going through the trees. That can be very calming, helping the child, their heart rate to calm down, their breathing to slow, as they do um, picking in the garden, digging, all of those things can be very healing. Work on the farm includes caring for animals, as well as growing and harvesting vegetables. So I've been in the garden collecting leaves and herbs and maybe preparing a nice salad or putting in all of the cooking. Lydia's already in the kitchen preparing the fantastic dish and we're going to have a nice dinner all together. The families then use the farm's produce to prepare and cook the meals, eat together and cooperate and share in joint activities. Today uh, you have seen um, a group of people rolling a tractor tire, two tractor tires, down um, into the garden so we can grow some potatoes in it. We ran out of beds to put our potatoes in, so it seemed like a, a, a logical thing to do, and it's worked. And it's, it's a deeply experiential um, activity for us all. Some of these activities are as new to us as they are to the families that come here. And that is great if our staff are slightly challenged uh, because they're doing something new they haven't done before. Um, that, is, that is very exciting. It's got to be safe, of course and it's got to be well thought through. 
you know, a challenge all round is a very, very, it, it provides equality um, between, uh, between the people who are engaged in it. And so our tractor rolling this morning was an equal experience for everybody and equally satisfying when we managed to just plop these things down. It's so wonderful to celebrate a good 10 whole years now of this work and looking back over the years at all the children and families who've gone through and we have um, a real connection with children and families who've gone, been here in the past and so we often get a knock on the door from a young man who's now got a girlfriend, wants to introduce her um, we keep in touch with families so it's a time of celebration for everybody involved. Tweet us at any point throughout the show using hashtag something brilliant to tell us about your inspiring stories. But that's all for part one, coming up after the break. We visited Elle's Cupcakery to find out what challenge she had in store for us. And we visit the King's Hall in Hearn Bay to learn about their conservation project. Today we're in Elspeth's local food market and the community has joined to showcase their fresh produce. From homemade jams to freshly sliced ham, this fantastic turnout proves that authenticity is still in high demand. Elspeth's Farmer's Market is a brand new event to be held on the third Sunday of every month. We visited Ellie's Cupcakery to find out what challenges she had in store for us. So I challenge you two to decorate these cupcakes with our two helpers here. Okay. There's your one. Thank you. Thank you. I will be with Alexander and his team. Yep, and I'm with Sebastian. One of those. We're going to win. I think farmers markets are really important because they show people out there that there is more to like the food produce than what you can get in a supermarket. What would you say is the importance of local events like this? It brings the community together, it allows people to um, start up small businesses and just get themselves out in the world. Squirt it well. Okay. Ah, I love my hands now. <laughs> and what do you think the importance is of the local community and events such as this? It's using Ken Produce for the local uh, community and then instead of spending in the supermarket, they spend into the com community. So, you know, the money is not going into supermarket pockets so much, it's going into traders' pockets. I'm done. So what are your top tips for icing cakes? Um, make sure that icing is cold enough, if it's a really hot day it tends to just melt. Um, also practice first, if you're going to be making sculptures out of fondant icing, practice before you stick them on the cake and once it's on there you're not going to get it off. How long did it take you to get to the level that you were at now? Because I imagine you didn't just wake up and think, cakes and... Yeah, I've always baked as a hobby, like when I was younger I started baking with my nan, so I've always done it, but I basically self-taught myself for cake decorating, and then last year I put myself through a City and Guilds qualification for sugar craft as well. How much fun is it to work alongside your wife at such a fantastic... Um, be honest. It can be fun. Yeah. It can be a bit stressful, you know, obviously it depends on how well you're doing as well. If you're doing well, then it's easier than if you're sort of standing around and nothing's happening and it's quiet and you're not, not selling. So it's, it, yeah, it, it's good fun. And Apart from getting up in the morning. Early yeah. Morning. And last but not least, what is your bestseller? <laughs> the Austrian hazelnut cake. The thing about sourdough as well is that it's not. Um, the dough takes a long time as well, so everything is, is really, really made by hand and everything's very organic, if that's the right word. Sourdough is a really, is a really nice, healthy option. It also has a great history. Also, it tastes better and it's not, no additives, there's no anything, no nothing. So generally a lot more, it's becoming a lot more fashionable as well. And what designs do you have on offer? 
Um, I pretty much do anything that people want, so I bake everything to order. So for farmers markets, I keep it quite simple, but I have done cakes with cars on, flowery cakes, princess cakes. I, don't know. I do think the boys did a better job than you two. That's yeah. very true. That's very true. So I think the winner is Lydia's team. Yay! Oh. <laughs> Two high fives down below. Yes. yes. And now, boys, we get to eat the cupcakes. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> the best bit. So I think it's fair to say that I won but also that taking part in local events really brings the community together. It does indeed, and you didn't win, I won. But if you're doing similar activities in your community and you would like to be part of our campaign, simply tweet out from your account, hashtag something brilliant, and join us. There are lots of different brilliant things that you could be doing. Find the ones in your region by visiting our website and remember, the little things really do make a big difference. Take to Twitter, hashtag something brilliant, and keep us up to date with all these little projects that you'll be doing. And to find out a bit more and to share your stories, log on to do somethingbrilliant.co.uk. Coming up. The King's Hall is an architectural gem, captivating visitors with its original Edwardian features and idyllic seafront view. And folk singer Lucky Jackson and his manager Sarah Quinn drop by for a quick chat about his new music. Welcome back to Brilliant Britain, the show that highlights inspiring local projects. The King's Hall was officially opened on the 10th of July 1913 by Princess Henry of Battenberg, youngest daughter of Queen Victoria, who named the proud new concert hall the King Edward VII Memorial Hall after her late brother. With the name shortened to the King's Hall, the building has been a centre of much of the town's social life for over a century. <laughs> Well, this place was built in uh, 1903 and it was a small assembly room. It was called the East Cliff Pavilion. There was no King's Hall then, it was just this one assembly room. And ten years later, they dug into the cliff and built the King's Hall. Big, big area where they have theatre, amateur dramatics, bands, always something going, weddings. This is an album of my photos that I've taken. I call it Footsteps in Time because it's something I feel that when I've gone, I've got, I've got something left behind, something of me. What I particularly like about this place, I think what's special about it, um, unique, is that any artist can show here, whether they're professional, amateurs, beginners, whatever, um, there's an opportunity for everyone to show here. And it's a good feel, it's a good mix, because we can all learn from each other, rather than this sort of big separation of all your profession, you're an amateur, uh, which is very divisive. So from a community point of view, it's, it, it, it's just a wonderful place. The very first exhibition was here at the King's Hall uh, foyer and it was exciting, it was such an exciting occasion. There was a lot of work, it was absolutely packed and there was a real electricity that night. Wonderful. How many events would you say per year? Well, we have two or three a week. I mean, a week's there are events you never hear about, but five events like the wake and the weddings. We have about five exhibitions in the King's Hall, which is in a really, a really lovely position. It's in, on the promenade right along the front and people can come in, there's a restaurant there and it's tailor-made for art. I think they won a lottery grant. Oh, what is lovely is that all the junior schools in Hanbei have a car concert here and all these little children are all singing on the stage there, it's lovely. Mm. This sort of thing is going to grow and it's going to sort of get bigger and bigger and it really has the potential of gaining even more popularity. As long as we just keep it going and keep the interest going because it's such a wonderful, and as you can see, it's a lovely building, wonderful location, and just literally a pebble's throw away from the beach. I met Maureen, my wife, got married, 
raised a family, I had two lovely daughters. Um, and Maureen died, unfortunately, quite early. She was only 48. So from then, I thought, well, I've got to start doing something. So I went back into art, and I used mainly a brush that is um, called a fan brush. The blend, when I put the white paint on, just blended it over. So we got this continuous, as I said, sea fret. I mean, sea fret is like a mist that comes in off the sea every now and again. And it, it's obviously early in the morning, it's a nice day you just can't see exactly where the horizon is. And that is oil on canvas. And I won the cup for that one this year in Herm Bay, best oil. So I was quite pleased with that. The hall was actually opened by the youngest daughter, Princess Henry of Battenberg, the youngest daughter of Queen Victoria. And there was a little girl presented a bouquet to her. And when we had the relaunch, 100 years later, the daughter of this little girl presented a bouquet to the Lord Mayor of Canterbury. What would you say the importance of gallery has been? Well, the importance uh, to me, and I suppose generally to the community as well, is that it's, it's helped, it really has helped. It's helped um, keep the creative hub of Herm Bay going. It's provided another location, another artistic location. Herm Bay is, has really got a sense of creativity. There's a lot of musicians, artists, writers, a hell of a lot of people, and a lot of people that are very proud of the heritage of the town, and proud of the town, and where, it, and where it's going now, they, they want to see it grow and develop. The town never sits still, and Herne Bay is one of those towns. And certainly, I think, I've been here for 17 years now, and I've noticed that it's become even more creative, more artists have come in here, and it's proven to be a very popular location. singer from Folkestone. That's like the cheesiest thing you've said all episode. But in fact we are today with Lucky Jackson and manager Sarah Quinn. Hi. Hi. How, are you doing? How are you guys? <laughs> when I went from the uh, cover scene to the original scene, the fan base that I picked up disappeared. Because mm. wow. they weren't interested. It was quite hard to start with, wasn't it? Yeah. They, it was they, quite hard to they, start They wanted with. to hear me sing Mustang Sally. They wanted to hear me sing Ain't No Sunshine. Because there is a very... There, they're very different entities. Mm. You have a cover scene and you have an original scene mm. and they are very, and it's, it's very rare that they do cross over. So when you start moving away from one thing, those people are suddenly, well, you know, we're not really interested. We just wanted to come out and dance to something that we know. And that's really frustrating because you're constantly trying to get across to people that just because you don't know this right now, the same the most famous Beatles song in the world was an original at one point that nobody knew or heard of. Now everybody knows it, and once that's so, it's really a not. It's it's so hard to get people to listen to original music because they think, oh, we just want to dance, we want to hear something that we all know and can sing along to. Um, but the original scene itself is very, very strong. It's got a very strong following of its own because that's where music all starts. It's the grassroots, and this is the other thing that I keep and I do. I preach and I spam and I constantly <laughs> harp on for everybody who will listen. But this is, that's the most frustrating thing, is getting across to people that these guys are the grassroots of music. Where did you come from? Was it from a void? I'm learning to play all of these, these jigs and reels and stuff like that, and just kind of strumming along. And play with a bucket on your head. And play with a bucket on my head. <laughs> What's the story? <laughs> There's this place called Downies, and uh, every year they do a, a, a Downie uh, bucket singing competition. It's just for fun. And you put a bucket over your head and you've got to sing a song and then they mark you and, and you know whoever wins gets They're laid. not kind though, it wasn't even a light plastic bucket. It no, was a it, big it's a proper, metal. It was a proper metal heavy bucket. <laughs> and we've been talking a lot about the rawness mm. of not only your performing but when you get into the studio and I mean I admitted that I almost cried when I heard one of your songs because it makes you think about everything that's happened in your life. It takes you to a certain time. Yeah, so. that that was that song. That song was called. Yeah. Uh, that, that was called. I really don't love you, uh, which is sort of quite. Uh, it says it in the title, right? But that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that, that if, if that affected you in the way that you know, if it, it sort of evoked these emotions, that's what songs should be. It should be. It's like like when you when you write a book and you read a story. You know, you should feel for the characters. You'd care whether they live or die. And it's the same thing with songs. You should be able to feel that emotion, and it should evoke something. So how long have you been writing for? 
Uh, I've been writing seriously for just about 10 years maybe I think now. Um, my early attempts were not so good. But they're never going to be, are they? I mean, you know, you've got to get experience in writing. Um, but it was only it was only about sort of ten years ago when I first write, wrote a few songs, and I was like, actually, this is quite good. These are quite good. And so the track you're going to be performing for us, could you tell us a little bit more about that? I know we've touched on it. A bit, yeah, but... yeah. Again, as I say, it's, it's called "I Love You All the Same." Um, it's uh, the, the first verse was actually uh, written the, the day after I, I, I met this particular uh, person. Um, and uh, it's just a song, it just sort of came, it was one of those ones that sort of came to me naturally, it just, it just it flowed out. And I think they're the best songs, I think, when they just flow out naturally. And uh, it's quite a nice little toe tapper, and hopefully it will, it will please the audience. Yeah. Do you have a name for your fans? Like One Direction of Directioners? Are you into no. Luckettes? Lockets? <laughs> the Luckettes? I can't think yeah, of anything. I'm, I'm trying here, I'm trying. No, no, no. You know what? Um, no, I, I, I don't want to follow that gimmick. I think I'm just, I'm just glad that, that people like the songs, and you know, and they, they, they do come along to gigs and they enjoy it. You know, they, they can refer to themselves as whatever they want, but I just refer to them as people who like my music. You know. It's... So we've had a lot of fun today, and we hope that we've inspired you to join your communities in your projects. If you want to find out more about the community projects featured in our episode, all you have to do is log on to dosomethingbrilliant.co.uk. Remember to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube and use hashtag somethingbrilliant to follow us as we go along. And now to play us out is Lucky Jackson with his brand new track, I Love You All The Same. Was it from a void? It wasn't so long ago that my heart was employed. I didn't know what I was looking for or how I felt. I'd even forgotten how real love was spelt. What's up guys, welcome back to the B-Vlog with yours truly, the guy with the stupidest and most awkward ideas on the planet. By the way, you're looking really, really sexy today. Nice. Really nice. Hope you've loved this video or at least not hated it. Let me know in the comments which one of them was it. Press like and if you're new to the channel, press subscribe to be sure to watch my new videos that come out every single Monday. So with that, I'm gonna wish you a really cool week and say my new favorite phrase, Milego Tygodnia, which is Polish for subscribe.